This is the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Hi everyone, it's Michael, known as Chicago Wiz, and welcome to another episode of the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Um, I apologize that this episode has been so long in the making. It's uh, it's been a interesting, very busy month for me. I've been adjusting to living in my new home, and uh, it's taken me kind of a... I'm actually kind of surprised at how long it's taken to kind of adjust and get the feel of rhythms and life and everything again. I was just commenting the other day on, I think it was either Discord or uh, Mastodon, how life has a rhythm and being on social media has a rhythm. And I really have not had the time to get back into that, Um, you know, between unpacking boxes and getting used to kind of a new work rhythm of of working at home full time. And then, um, well, it's fall and there are other activities uh, that uh, uh, take up my time during the fall and that's been coming on. So yeah, Um, but here I am. It is Saturday morning and uh, in a couple of hours, I'm going to be running a traveler game at Gamehole Con here in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, it's been a fun convention so far. I've uh, only had time to play in one game. I had a family emergency that I had to run all the way back to Galena for. and uh, uh, But that's fine. Everything is taken care of. Uh, all is well. And I uh, came back. So I missed one game. But I played an interesting game last night that was more of a board game than a fantasy RPG. But... It definitely was a uh, fantasy-based game called Hex Explorer. I think the name of the game is. I don't know. It was it was pretty complicated, and there was a lot of moving parts, and I just kind of went along for the ride and played the usual scoundrel kind of character I did, and uh, it ended up being a fun game. But Game Ocon is such a great little convention. There's such a great uh, feeling here. And I did yesterday morning attend a seminar by Mark Miller, the um, one of the main designers behind um, uh, Traveler and certainly the, the main evangelist. And uh, he was talking about how he did rules and whatnot. So um, more to come on that later because this episode I promised that I would talk um, about my infinite barrel of monkeys and how I take uh, modules, mainly OSR modules, since that's the style of game that I play, and how I take them and make them more into source books rather than following along the modules step by step and uh, piece by piece. Um, this really... <sighs> it's hard to trace where I've done this um, or when I started doing this because I kind of have always taken modules more as, um, what's that phrase from the the Pirates of the Caribbean movie? Um, uh, You know, with the rules, we see them more as guidelines instead of rules. Well, that's kind of what I do. Um, A module to me is more of a guideline rather than an explicit step-by-step, do this, do this, do this, do this. Um, Probably from the very beginning. I mean, if you look at Keep on the Borderland, uh, the the, you know famous uh, basic module B2, that one is very sandboxy. That one has a lot of these things that I'm going to talk about here. And I guess, you know, there's really no linear aspect to it unless you choose to run it linearly, which I guess you could. And ever since then, I guess maybe, you know, I, I didn't get into too much the um, the A series and the D series and the Q series of um, AD&D modules. 
Um, we usually home brewed our own. So maybe because I didn't learn in that style, this is why I, I approach modules differently. I don't know. But to me, a module, just kind of taking a step back and, and explaining the why, to me, a module is a way of presenting the author's vision of how certain elements in a fantasy world interact. And everybody's going to be different. I have a feeling even if I did run modules linearly or as railroads that, you know, each run through would be slightly different. But I don't like to do that. I, I don't know. Um... For me, running modules like that tends, and I know everybody's going to run to the uh, Dragonlance series as, as the extreme, but, you know, all modules that I've kind of applied this technique to or this approach to, the call it the Infinite Barrel of Monkeys approach, um, all modules tend to give me the same bits of information. And with those bits of information, then that gives me enough to work with so that I kind of make the module my own. Um, I've done this in the past for a number of modules that I've then really uh, worked into my campaign world. And most recently, I've been doing this for the uh, T1 Village of Hamlet module that I created my own version of OD&D and Chainmail for. So... Um, what is this technique? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll name you the steps, and I apologize for the paper. I've kind of written my notes down on paper here, so you're going to hear it um, rattling. For preparation, I have five steps. Uh, number one, obviously, read the module. <laughs> kind of goes without saying. Uh, number two, I ID major NPCs, factions, locations. Number three, I schedule. I come up with a timeline of the module. Or you could call it maybe uh, a flowchart. Number four, IID points of the plan that are going to change based on the players. And number five, finally, I come up with three hooks that will grab the PCs and pull them into the uh, module. So I'm going to go into those in detail and then I'm going to talk about how I adapt this in play. Um, obviously, reading the module goes without saying. Um, I read it from cover to cover, and um, I have a highlighter or um, you know, notepad, legal pad, what have you, next to it, because I'm going to take notes as I go. Um, and I, again, read it from cover to cover, and I try hard to just read it like a book, if you will, absorb it, absorb the information, figure out what's what, what's where. Um, you know, different modules are laid out differently. Some modules give me, you know, great information up front, very well organized, uh, very you know, useful to the DM. Other modules, not so much, you know, <laughs> they, they spread information all around and you've got bits here and bits there and whatnot. And so I try to get a f sense of that flow and how things are going to be organized and what I need where. Then the second thing that I do is I identify three major groupings. First, I identify the major NPCs um, who, who are key to the module and the story or the plot or the, the thing that the author is trying to show. I also identify major factions. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that there's faction play, but I am going to kind of identify the major groupings here. You know, it may be as simple as law versus chaos, um, or it could be, you know, um, each major NPC is part of a different group, um, and so on. And I should probably do an episode where I actually show this in practice, and, and maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do... Um, I talked to... Um, uh, I don't want to give a surprise away. Never mind. Um, but yeah, I should do this to a module and, and kind of show that. So factions are one of those that maybe I'll find things, but I at least want to identify, you know, is this, you know, two um, competing factions? Are these two factions that maybe are in friendly competition or are they in out-and-out -out war, what have you? Um, and then I will, the third thing that I'll identify are the major locations. 
you know, what is going to be the PC's home base? What are the major areas that the author has fleshed out? Where are they in relationship to each other and so on? And for each of these, what I will do is I will identify the different key points, such as for the NPCs and factions, what are their goals? You know, the the NPC has some reason to be here, some reason to interact. What what is the module telling me about what they want to do to do and achieve? Um, the I'll also look for what are the conflicts. You know, the, what conflicts does the NPC have with other NPCs? What potential conflicts might the NPC have with the players? I'll also identify resources that. Um, the NPC or the faction has, or that the location may provide. Um, things like, you know, major magic items um, or resources that the players may tap into if they buy into any of the underlying uh, hooks or, or themes that are going on during the module. Um, and then I try to identify the relationships because obviously the, rela the relationships between the NPCs, between each other, the factions, and to the locations is important. Um, and that there gives me all the pieces that you could kind of find in a sandbox. So I guess, you know, here I'm taking the module and I am breaking it down into a sandboxy kind of, of, of thing. You know, what are the big pieces that will be moved around? The next thing, however, is the thing that helps tie all this together. Um, I come up with what I call my schedule. Now, it may literally be a schedule of, you know, okay, in three days this might happen, and in two days this might happen. It might be a flowchart, you know. Um, PCs do this, so this may happen, and this may happen. And this is where having those major NPCs and factions and relationships and locations is key because this allows me to put together a picture and I start with what happens if the PCs never showed up. Now, for most modules, this is going to be the basic plot line that is already woven throughout the um, uh, throughout the module. Now, some modules this is easy to do because the module may already be laid out like a sandbox, um, or the module may already assume, hey, you know, this is kind of the the NPCs and the module's default schedule or default flow, so this is what happens here and here and here and so on. Um, but other modules definitely may say, hey, you know, especially in the more linear railroady ones, the PCs do this, then this happens, and then the PCs do this, and then this happens, and so on. You know, and, and I kind of think of that as an ABC kind of module. Um, this is a little bit harder because now you're going to have to do a little work and remove those dependencies on the PCs and kind of imagine what would life be like if the PCs hadn't done anything. You know, a very basic setup. Uh, you know, the, the uh, bad guy starts off with a goal of taking over a town and the PCs come in and discover the treachery, you know, and they, they discover something, you know, a major clue. And so if the PCs discover that clue, then the, uh, you know, the, the bad person is going to do this now and step up to plans or what have you. Um, assume that that's going to happen without the PCs. You know, take that default action. And what I do then is that then this schedule or this flowchart drives the adventure. And it also introduces the element of what is um, the stress or the pressure behind the PCs to do the thing. And this is where, you know, again, if you think of it like a sandbox, you know, if, as the PCs move through the world, the world is going to react back. As the PCs move through the elements of this module, what would be the, um, the, the natural thing to happen? What would happen if they didn't move, you know, if they weren't involved, things would reach a culmination point. Um, and as the PCs do go through the module, then, then how, how does that happen? That kind of feeds into the fourth point, is that what points in this schedule can the PCs affect? 
um, or how would different conflicts or relationships be affected as the PCs interfere? And these are the points where you're going to kind of have branches. You know, you're going to look at something and say, well, if the PCs have done X, then all of these different people are going to react in a certain way. Now, you might say, well, Mike, you know, that's how a module is written. Well, yes, but I've kind of removed back from the schedule and I'm not impressing on the PCs that you have to do X, Y, Z. It's kind of, you know, Going back to a Shrekism, it's an onion. As you peel away the layers, you're getting to the closer to the core of the thing. But I'm not forcing the PCs. I'm not presenting the module in such a way that the PCs have to do this. You know, if let's say, going back to my kind of crude example, that the you know the the big baddie wants to take over the town and has a plot afoot to do so and is working with the local thieves guild to make that happen. Um, and in three days, if the you know the the plan is is that they're going to assassinate the uh, Duke and Duchess, and so as the PCs interfere or maybe stumble onto things, then you know one of the logical points may be the PCs find the uh, um, the betrayer. You know, they, they find the servant that was going to let the thieves into the Duke and Duchess's palace. Uh, you know, plans may change. They may get moved up. A lot of modules don't. <laughs> they, they either assume that the PCs are going to find the servant and that's the adventure or that the PCs, uh, you know, um, are going to find the servant in a certain way at a certain time. I'm not going to assume that if the PCs are, you know, bumping around. Day three, boom, the, the servant's going to let the thieves in and the Duke and Duchess are going to be assassinated. And then now you have a very different module of what happens next and so on. And, and that's where having that schedule and that flow chart gives me those tools. Because probably the module was written to assume the PCs are going to be the heroes of the day. Well, in this case, they didn't. But you still have all of the elements from this module of a great adventure of now the PCs have to deal with the aftermath of an assassination and prove the big baddie is indeed the big baddie or, or what have you. I, I hope I'm, I'm getting the point across. So the schedule and then identifying the points where the PCs could majorly change things is key in helping yourself build up what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. Um, you know, because obviously the PCs could do any number of things that would, you know, change the flow, some more major than others. And, and as I'm planning this out, I kind of want to have that in the back of my head on, you know, reflective on my schedule and, and whatnot so that I can be mostly prepared. All right. And then the final bit, the three hooks. Um, modules are funny because a lot of times, you know, especially at a convention, you know, you're going to basically put somebody right in the middle of the action or kind of, you know, put them on the choo-choo convention railroad, what have you. But, you know, if this is your home game or your home campaign or what have you, you may not want to do that as much. I try to give the players three things that will grab their attention and pull them somehow into what the main thrust of the area or the quest or the, um, what have you. And I will also, at the same time, try to identify what I call three little distractions. You know, what are three things that you could have the PCs do out of this module that may you know, introduce them to a particular location that is key to this module, or maybe introduce them into the idea or hearing about a resource that they may need for the module. Now here again, not necessarily putting them on a linear path towards the MacGuffin, but giving them something that just dangles them along and will eventually get them there. Plus, you know, the three hooks is kind of easy to to figure out, you know, you're trying to give the PC a way of knowing what's going on. You know, they they overhear somebody at a bar talking about so and so is acting really suspicious and has been meeting with you know uh, near duels and in dark alleys and talking about bad things. You know, that could be one hook or 
You know, another hook is you've been sent by this person to find this mysterious plant. And after a little research, you realize that the plant is actually a really nasty poison. Uh, You know, hooks that you can apply to pull the PCs into the major thread. That's probably an easy way. All right. So those are the five elements that I do when I'm pulling a module apart. And again, they are reading the module, IDing the major NPCs, factions, and locations, coming up with my schedule and or time flow, assuming that the PCs do nothing, are not totally not involved, um, identifying the points that the PCs can get involved and some likely reactions to that. And then finally, the three hooks and or and three subquests. You, know, you, you can do those if, if you want. During play. So I've got this module, I've got all these elements. Uh, point number one is tracking the time and events. And that's very key because if the PCs are just kind of, you know, doing what they do and getting, you know, lost in, in minutia or, or not picking up on things, you want the world to be continuing to move on around them in a very dynamic way that it would. You know, the PCs aren't getting involved in the big baddies plot, but the PCs are seeing elements of that come into play. Um as the PCs do get involved, you're going to have to update the schedule. You're going to have to update your NPCs and factions because if the PCs are doing what they're usually going to do, they're applying burning oil to everything and making a mess of everybody's plans, and that's okay. That's what you want to have happen, but you also want the world to react to that. And so how do things change? How do things shift? And having kind of that schedule in the back of your head is much easier than to read into it and figure, well, you know, the world's going to react like this than if you didn't do that at the beginning. And then finally, um, you know, as the schedule goes on, don't be afraid to let the PCs know that things are happening around them. You know, obviously it's going to be very easy if in my cute little example, the Duke and Duchess have been assassinated because everybody's going to be upset and there's a crime and, you know, the local uh, law authority is going to be running around trying to find the murderer. Maybe the PCs become under... uh, suspicion themselves for whatever reason but they're going to see things happen and they're going to know that things are happening and they should because even if you've gone way off the path of where the original plot of the module had um you still have all these pieces you still have all those elements that the um, author had now you've just got yourself a brand new adventure that you and your party have invented because of their actions. And that modules and all of the uh, things that are in it are still totally valid, just not in the way that the author may be intended. Whew, how did I manage to do this in 20 minutes? All right, well, um, as I mentioned, I'm recording this at Gamehole Con. I'm just going to kind of release it as is. So apologize that there's no intro and outro music. Um... And uh, yeah, maybe next uh, next time I will uh, take a module and actually apply these elements to that, and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, my apologies to the folks that have left me call-ins. Um, I'm not going to be able to put your uh, messages here. I do have them queued up. They are sitting at home in a folder, and once my life permits, I will get to those and answer those and, and put out an episode of Collins. So that's it. So until next time, um, and especially if you're here this weekend at Gamehole Con or if you're at another convention somewhere else or if you're participating in a game this weekend, hope you have fun and game on. <laughs>